Thank you very much. Appreciate the talk. Hello, everybody. Um, as introduced, I'm Michael Jeanfroy. I'm a senior economist for the Department of Workforce Services, and I'm here to talk about our economy. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on today. We're going to talk about a, a brief update of where we are, kind of a uh, comparison to other states as well. Some of the population trends we have, uh, if you haven't, it kind of came in and out of the news really quickly, but uh, we have some long-term demographic shifts that are going on that can help at or hurt Utah, depending on how the future goes. We're going to talk about those. In-migration is becoming an increasingly prevalent part of our labor force, so we're going to talk about that a little bit, and then the cost of Utah and some of the things that we're facing going forward. So there's a pretty wide variety of things happening. Um, okay, so where are we? Right now in Utah, we've come back from the pandemic recession pretty quickly. We gained 150 jobs since before the pandemic, right? So we're above where we were during the pandemic. And we came back really quickly compared to the rest of the nation. So if you look during the, right here, we have the Great Recession and then the pandemic recession. The U.S. has taken longer to come out of it in both times, right? Six and a half years to come out of the Great Recession, almost three years to come out of the pandemic recession. Uh, for Utah, we came out of those, both of those a lot faster. In particular, this most recent one, we came out in almost half the time where we had employment above where we were uh, before the recession. A lot of this comes down to Utah's demographics. So this is a map of the 2010 to 2020 census changes across the U.S. The fastest growing state in the United States was Utah. That's us. And it's a combination of the fact that we have a very family-friendly culture where we have a high replacement rate, and then we also have a lot of people moving in right now because we've had a, a huge amount of job opportunities over the last couple of years. One thing to note during this change, you'll see a lot of, a lot of the western states are growing, um, but uh, it tends to be metros. It's the exact same info, but it's broken down into counties. And you can see that in a lot of these states, whether or not they're having positive or negative, there's, there's a, a move into the metro areas, move into cities. So for us, it's the Wasatch Front, it's Washington. We get a lot of people in those areas. Cash gets, has some influx as well, but moving out of a lot of rural areas. Um, even in states that see a lot of growth. Uh, this is fueled, so this is a year-over growth rate of our different MSAs. When you look at the economy in general, you don't break things up by county lines because there's not clear distinctions of economic boundaries along those lines. You know, the line between Weber and, and Box Helder, for example, in terms of manufacturing is very thin. You know, you don't worry too much about living in Weber and, and driving out to Box Helder, vice versa. So we tend to look at big chunks of, of counties at a time. You can see here that all the MSAs, all the major economic areas in Utah, are at positive growth rates before the pandemic, coming into it between like two to 5%. Coming out of it, we see that sharp downturn from the pandemic. The spike a year later is actually just a, a data thing where it shows a great year over growth rate because it's comparing to the drop, right? That's where we have that big spike a year later. It's measuring from the lowest point that we have. But then coming out of that, back into 2022, we have a pretty high growth, growth rates, pretty elevated growth rates, almost 5% across the board. That's just starting to slow down over 2022. 2023, we're starting to see a little bit of a slowdown as well. The growth, rate, growth rates are coming back down a little bit to, uh, from those elevated rates. Um, like we mentioned before, we have a lot of entrepreneurship in Utah. We do have a lot of companies starting right now. The West had a, a huge influx of business applications. So Utah, for example, is on the high end of this. We had a 21.5% increase in business applications year over from 2022 to 2023. So people are trying to take advantage of, um, you know, the opportunities here. There's more labor available here than in a lot of places. And so we still see this forward momentum of companies open up. This is reflective of entrepreneurship because it's a lot of small companies opening up. Um, and it's led to a lot of wage gains, right? We have high growth rates, we have low unemployment, we have companies opening up, we have a lot of large firms already established here. And over the last couple of years, we've seen wages increase. This is the most recent data we have from the BLS. They keep track of counties with a labor force of 75,000 people or above, a little closer than other areas because you can get a better survey response from those larger areas. Cash is just away from this. The highest we've gotten is a 72,000 uh, employment. So within the next few years, they should be included in this. But these statistics do cover 84.2% of employment within the state. And you can see that we've seen some really strong wages, especially up here in the north between Davis and Weber. We've had some really aggressive growth rates in wages over the last year. Um, and this is because of people looking for labor. Now, specifically, they're looking for a different type of labor than we've had in the past. Or we see big shortages on the lower end of education. Um, as mentioned, we do have a lot of data available online. This is one of the ones I've made that is available on our DWS website, if anyone's curious. Uh, but it tracks earnings over time, adjusted for inflation, and you can break it down into demographics like race, uh, gender, and education. 
breaking this down into education, if you look at this bottom right one, it gets normalized to 2015 and adjusted for inflation. And so what you're looking for is, are you making more than you were previous if you include your wage gains and you subtract out inflation? And you can see that people that are making the most increases over time are actually at the really low end of education where we need a lot of people. This, this uh, dearth of bodies is becoming more prevalent over time. So you can see the light blue line, less than high school have experienced the highest growth over the last few years. And this isn't just pandemic. I like picking stuff from before the pandemic to point out that the pandemic made changes, but what you see in, in recessions is oftentimes they exacerbate things that are already in the labor force, right? We already had telecommuting as, as a thing, but we saw that the pandemic came and it really pushed that ahead. It accelerated that into other areas of the market that hadn't experienced that. Or baby boomers retiring. That was already starting to happen. The pandemic kind of pushed that forward. This recession pushed more people into retirement than before. We see less labor force, and we'll get into that, less people working than we have in the past. And what that means is a, a more value than there used to be on just showing up. Um, like Dr. Boyle talked about, being a good person, coming and showing up and being somebody who's consistent, who works, they're not looking for qualifications when you're getting hired at a hotel or an Amazon warehouse or at Walmart. They're making sure that you show up, you don't steal, you breathe, things like that. And it, just being alive and being a body to show up has more value than it has in the past because some of these demographic changes in the background. So part of this issue is Utah is a pretty educated state. We like education. This is a mismatch right now between what jobs are available in the market and what qualifications people have. So on the blue on the left here, you see um, the education of Utah adults, right? This is the percentage of our population that actually has that kind of an education. So 7% of Utah adults have less than a high school diploma. Uh, we've got one fifth or one fourth, 25% have some college all the way up through, you know, graduate professional. On the other side, the red is the occupational mix or how many jobs are in Utah that require that, num that amount of education. So where you see some mismatches, for example, is in high school. We don't have that many people who have only a high school education, right? We actually have more people with a bachelor's degree than just a high school education. But almost 40% of jobs in Utah only care about the high school thing. And this is kind of that, you, you hear from economists a lot, well, anybody who wants to work and get a job because there's really low unemployment, and that is true. But you also hear that flip side of people who just graduated from college and are like, I am searching everywhere and everyone's telling me I can get a job and I can't. And it's because of this mismatch, right? It's this difference that it's, it's hard to find a job that values the specifications or qualifications or specifications that you have compared to somebody who just shows up and says, I just want a job, I don't care, and I'm looking for whoever can pay me the most, right? That's where we're seeing those wage gains because they don't care who they work for, they're just going to see the bottom line increase. They're moving to the job that's gonna pay the most. Um, and the more educated you get, you have less options in switching because only specific jobs value the skill set that you bring and will pay you for those. So that's part of the difficulty and why you see these wage gains on the lower end versus of education versus the higher end, which is where you normally typically see them. Now, regardless of what your education is, unemployment in Utah is really low. Historically, the less educated you are, the more likely you are to become fired because you're easier to get replaced, things like that. Um, but in Utah, across the board, I've added an orange line on top there. That's new. Before we had Utah and just the MSAs. Now we have Utah and the US added as well. To point out that Utah stays lower in unemployment rate, basically across the board, than, than the US does. We're really good in comparison about that. So we had low rates coming into the pandemic. After a year, year and a half, we got back down to really low, low rates as well. And we're to a point, actually, where there's a lot of competition, as I pointed out, for workers, right? Before we went into the pandemic, we already had economists talking about the speed of the labor market, that we had really low unemployment rate, that employers had to compete for workers. As you're competing for workers, the price of labor goes up. As the price of labor goes up, the economy tends to slow down because it gets too hot, right? You end up not being able to take, uh, uh, when I need an engineer and I can't find an unemployed one, I have to pay that engineer more than they're making to come work for me, right? And as that gets more and more expensive, things tend to slow down. So we were already looking at an economic slowdown coming into the pandemic, to point out. And we're back at those conditions again, where we're competing for workers. Um, in Utah, we have higher labor force participation now than we had pre-pandemic, which is another really good sign, right? We have a lot of people moving in. They come with four jobs normally, and so they add to that employed person's pool. Um, but our part labor force participation has actually risen from pre-pandemic to post-pandemic because of all these different job opportunities compared to the United States where they still don't have labor force participation equal to when they went into this whole thing. So we've done pretty well. Um, we've got motivated people to get into the workforce because of these good opportunities and these wage gains. Uh, by state, we are, since pre-pandemic to now, the second fastest growing state in jobs. The only one who beats us right now is Idaho. 
And you'll notice a lot of similarities in demographics between Idaho and Utah. They're very similar. But we are the two fastest growing states within the United States as of February 2020 to December 2023. Um, and you'll notice, though, the weird part is if you look on the bottom, there's still a set of states that are struggling to reach pre-pandemic employment. Right? These are states that have less jobs right now than they had coming into 2020. And the weird part is when you look at unemployment by state across the United States, there's really nowhere that has these really alarmingly high unemployment rates. Right? In economics, we consider full employment to be usually around like 4.5%. And there's not really states where you get up into like high unemployment, like 6 to 10%, which is something that you'd expect to see in a state that doesn't have the same amount of jobs as they had four years ago. Um, now, this kind of gets to this background thing I've mentioned a couple times of this demographic shift that can help, it has helped Utah for a long time, but, but things are starting to switch a little bit. So this is a long, this is a story that goes back a while ago. We're starting back in 1960, and we'll get through this pretty quick, but these are age trees. So you're breaking down the population into male and female, and then by five-year brackets, right? So on the bottom, you've got zero to four-year-olds, five to nine, going up. On the left side, you have males. On the right side, you have females. And they're called population trees, because you want it to look like a Christmas tree, right? In theory is the idea that at the bottom end, you've got a lot of young people. As those people age, people die off, it happens. You get to the top of the tree, people who have lived for 85 plus years, little star on top, right? But what we're starting to see over time is that that, that tree shape is starting to shift a little bit and is moving from what we've seen historically. So on the right here, across the United States in 1960, we had 9%, almost 10% of our population 65 or above, which is a big one because when people hit 65, labor force participation rate really drops off. So we kind of consider that the end of a career on average. Um, and we had 31% of our population that was going to age in and take jobs, right? So in 20 years from being born, you're going to be in the labor force probably working a job. Um, and so these things take time, right? We're watching this baby boomer generation move up. This is the 1970s. 1980s, they're moving into their careers, right? You've got 30-year-olds. The, the very tail end of baby boomers are now in uh, their high school years. But what we start to see is a big difference between U.S. and USA start to, or excuse me, Utah and USA start to emerge. It's this bottom generation, right? So baby boomers across the U.S. didn't replace themselves. They didn't have enough kids. Versus in Utah, we have that very family-friendly culture. We have lots of kids on average. Um, and we did have another generation. Right? We've got kids now that baby boomers are in child rearing ages between 20 to 35, right? Uh, we're starting to have kids here and that's not necessarily happening on the US side. Now in the 1990s, this is this, uh, the idea of like the rat race. Baby boomers are in the middle of their career. We've got the US economy is loving all this cheap labor. They're just eating it up. There's the idea that you have to be loyal to the company. They'll be loyal to you. Don't mess up because you're replaceable. And you were because there were a lot of people moving in. And the baby boomer generation was a little different than previous generations in terms of willingness to work. We had a lot more women willing to work in that generation than before. Um, there's talk about how World War II kind of broke down some of those barriers to entrance, but a lot of it was family planning really in the 60s and 70s. And so the generation after that grew up with this, that's now entering the labor force, having that as a regular thing, it's okay to pick to not be a mom. You know, you can pick to be a career woman and it's not as big of a deal. And so we have a higher percentage of this generation willing to work than any generation previous, and we actually got up to our record high labor force participation rate in the US, which is a little over 72%, around 73%. Now, we get into the 2000s, and we're getting into retirement ages. On the left, we still have a fairly healthy tree. On the right, you're starting to see an hourglass figure start to form. And then in 2010, Utah and the United States kind of differ again here. And what happened in Utah was the blue shifts, the primary generation in the labor force, is now millennials. That happened before 2010 in Utah because we had so many young people. In the United States, that didn't happen until 2016, right? They're still relying on these baby boomers as a major part of the labor force. And what ends up happening is you have a worker vacuum. I work with manufacturing a lot. This is a big one here because baby boomers are overrepresented by a little bit in blue collar work. So you see a lot of institutional knowledge go away as these people leave, right? And the issue is there's not necessarily enough young people to come and replace those jobs, let alone grow let alone have new jobs opening up, right? And what happens for us, we could stretch, right? Our economy kept growing. We had young people to come in. As always, if they have better opportunities somewhere else, there's nothing tying them to Utah if they had great opportunities other places. But this is kind of the backbone of how we can come out of things like the Great Recession so much faster than the United States because we have all these young workers who are able to come in versus other areas that are struggling with labor. Labor is one of the big inputs to an economy. 
Uh, by 2020, we see some of the things have shifted, right? We, before we had 9% of our population above 65, now I've got 166 and before we had 31% of our population that was going to age into having jobs, and now we've got 18.4%. Now, it, it is a national problem. I will point out on the US side, or on the Utah side, we are starting to slow down a little bit, right? So over time, this has changed a bit because we've had this negative projection of going into bad growth it was really bad like two years ago, right? Two, three years ago, because during the pandemic, we had our mortality rates increase, we had birth rates decrease, and we had immigration plummet. So all three of those things led to really bad things for the U.S. population altogether. You can see historically, this is where we've been all the way back to 1900. Before the 1900s, we had you know, between 1.8 and 2% increase over, uh, per year. Since then, you can see these big divots for World War I, for the Great Recession and World War II. During the 1960s, it kind of comes down, right? That's what I talked about, how things changed in that birth rate across the United States. They stay relatively steady through like the 70s and 80s, a little bit of boom during the 90s economic, or uh, 1990s economic rush. But then we come back down during the 2000 and 2010s and it decreases by quite a bit. It isn't until the last two years actually where we started seeing some increases from exactly what I said. Mortality is now going down as the recession's behind us. Birth rates are increasing again, which is good. And immigration is, is coming back, which is leading to positive growth again. We were projected to go negative. Big part of this is fertility rates. This is Utah and United States fertility rates. To reach replacement, you need 2.1 kids per birthing mother, right? You have two kids, two, a couple makes two kids, and you know a few of them die, so 2.1% or 2.1 replacement. That's the dotted line there. You can see the gray, the United States, we hit below there early 1970s, right? That's the time bomb 20 years later is when we're starting to see that kind of stuff. And then in Utah, we didn't hit, we didn't hit below replacement rates until 2016. So ours, it's a long delay, right? We, we just saw on that population tree that just the very bottom of our stuff is not gonna be as large as they were before. Um, but it's a problem that the rest of the United States has been struggling with for a while and has been the backbone of our strength for you know, 40 years now. All right, population change, like I mentioned, this is that little, that little bump at the bottom right of the graph. This is examining that and breaking that into what is causing that increase. You have blue is immigration, uh, net immigration over the years, and then the orange is natural increase, which is births minus deaths. So over these last couple years, we've seen the birth and death rate change a little bit, largely dependent on mortality going down, but then also we've seen that increase in immigration back again, which has helped a lot with fueling positive growth. Like I said, we don't have enough producers on the bottom, right? That's, this is the issue. As people age out, they're not dead, they're still alive, they're living in a house, they're consuming goods, but they're not making anything. And when we talk about a world where we've experienced pretty bad inflation over the last couple of years, inflation fundamentally is more money chasing fewer goods, right? It can happen on either side. It can happen on the demand or supply side of the equation. And in this, where we're, where we're going to have issues is we won't necessarily have the supply. We won't have people making as much as they used to, um, or as, as many people making things. So it's a, it's a big problem. It's a demographic shift that happens over time. It causes a lot of things in Utah, for example, like we've got higher inflation, more dollars chasing fewer goods. It leads to calcification in the housing market, like St. George, for example, or really anywhere in Utah. If you're sitting on a house between three and four percent, you're not going to refinance right now, right? Um, and older people are, tend to be in that, right? More than younger people. The house home ownership percentage is just higher. It also feeds into things like inflation, like Social Security, as we have a population that gets older and older. Social Security is pegged to the CPI. As CPI measures higher inflation, we get a big COLA adjustment, right? And that cost of living adjustment causes more inflation because now they're paying more out. It's more money into the system, more money, fewer goods. Um, so it's, it's not great. You've got to come up with some ways to kind of handle this thing. So there's six plausible or combined macro solutions if we want to continue growth, um, you know, knowing that as things stand in the long run, we're not going to be at replacement levels. Some of them are incentivized or pressure, pressure baby boomers to stay in the labor market. We've seen discussions about the retirement age changing when benefits happening, changing, or paying people you know, on a private side being willing to pay someone to stay in a little bit longer. Um, import products, right, make it easier to, to answer that supply side of things as we have people aging and still consuming and we have less producers in the United States, make things easier to bring in. Import labor, immigration, helps with that on the supply side as well. We've talked a lot about offsetting the departing labor with automation and artificial intelligence, which might be one of the good sides of the story, which is that we, we hear about uh, you know, AI coming in and taking a lot of jobs, which they're very productive. They do a lot of things very, very well. Um, but they don't buy things. They don't need a house. 
They don't need food. They do need a technician, which is a new job, but they don't buy things in the way that a regular worker is. And so this is a, it's a pretty nuanced situation there on how are we going to continue the economy if, if my job can get taken, but that person or thing that took my job doesn't do any of the other stuff I do, right? They don't raise families. They don't get involved in the community in the same way. So things like that are going to shift. Um, incentivizing births, right? Make it easier and more affordable to have children. Increase tax credits for that kind of stuff. Or let the economy naturally shrink. Right? Over time, if we don't have labor and we, we cut off immigration, for example, the economy would shrink with a dearth of labor. Um, so we'll see how, how legislation and, and society reacts to some of this stuff over the next years, because it is a ticking time bomb over time. It's not right now. These are generational issues. So what's fueling our growth in Utah? If we've had a, you know, high growth rates over the last bit, we've talked about this. It's, it's in migration to the state. We have a lot of people moving in which is on top of our really, like, among the highest in the nation fertility rates, right? So both of those things are good for us, at least to a lot of labor. Where are they moving? On the right side is kind of looking at over the last uh, data that we have, which is 2022, um, where people have moved into Utah by size, right? So big metros have actually lost a little bit. Salt Lake has lost some, some population. Um, but we see areas like Washington, Cache, Box Elder, where they're a little bit more rural, have a lot of growth, especially if they're connected to some kind of metro. Um, and midside met metros kind of depends on where you are. Davis has seen small losses. Weber's seen increases. A lot of that is geographic, right? Davis is landlocked. There's things all around it where Weber, you've still got a little bit of land to the north. Looking at some of the counties, I don't have all the counties on here. It'd take too long to go through, but I wanted to grab some highlights real quick. This is Utah, and there's two, th two things to note. First, just to understand the graph, the blue is the natural increase. That's our kids minus deaths, right? The green is international migration, people coming from a different country and moving into that area. And then the red is domestic migration, migration of only people who are already citizens of the United States moving into our state. And there's two big parts here. One, well, three, I guess. One would be the fact that this is not a pandemic thing. This is longer than that, right? This has been going on since the 2010s. We've been in a machine of economic growth. We've had a lot of people move in during that time. Um, and it's not just uh, post-pandemic that's caused a lot of this labor stuff. Second thing, 2021 was the first year in US or in Utah history where we've had more growth in the state due to people moving in than us having kids, which didn't repeat, right? 2022, 2023, those are different. But there's a lot of proje projections that with this declining fertility rate, 20 years from now, that's gonna become a, a huge prevalent part of in, in growth into, the, into our state. 2023, you can see how that's kind of slowing down, right? There's not a ton of answers specifically on why that is, but we gain a lot of people from other states, right? We got like, I think 18,000 people from California, but we gave like 10,000 back to them, right? We have people leaving the state too. And so it's starting to level out in terms of, I think of affordability of people being able to move in here. And we'll see if that maintains positivity over the next few years. Salt Lake, like I mentioned, they're losing people. It's expensive to live in Salt Lake when you can move somewhere else, especially with the increase in telecommuting and things shifting post pandemic. But again, this is not something just new to the pandemic. We did see people moving out before then as well. So it's not necessarily a new trend. Cache County, that's seen a huge influx of people over the last couple of years, right? They're, they're dealing with schools where we're talking about declining fertility rates and their schools are like, how do we even keep up with how many people are moving into our area? Because we have more families than we anticipated, especially if you look at the history, right? They didn't anticipate this many people moving into their area in such a short amount of time, but there's jobs and there's room. And that's what somebody needs, right? Uh, Tooele, same thing. We have a huge amount of people moving in. You can work in Salt Lake, but you don't have the same kind of restrictions in terms of trying to live in the big city. Um, Iron County, down south, this has been a long time thing. This has been a part of their population for a long time. Box Elder, again, we've had thousands of people move in over the last couple of years that they were not anticipating. We're talking about, you know, 600 or less people from natural increase. And then over the last few years, we're getting up to almost 2,000 people a year that are moving into these areas. It's fueled all the job gains that we've had, right? We talk about low unemployment, how people here are already working, and then yet we still have really high growth rates. Why? This is why we have a lot of people moving into Utah, uh, which helps fuel this. You know, they see an opportunity and they're gonna come for it. Weber County is one of the metros that does see growth, for example, that's a little landlocked versus Davis that doesn't. Davis is starting to see some population loss because they're just too, too squished in there. Washington, same thing. Now, like I mentioned, California, this is another state. California is losing a ton of people. They also gain a lot. They have the biggest population in the US. It's like 340 million, something like that, right? 350 million. It's a lot of people. So when you talk about flat numbers in and out, that is a part of our, our you know, of people coming into uh, Utah. But California is very close, and there's a lot of people. And we've lost a lot of people to them as well. So it is kind of a, 
a labor exchange. But that's where you see people move out, right? There's not the job opportunities. There's not the space. You gotta go somewhere where there is the job. There is the space. All right, so this does lead to some potential problems, right? People are moving into, into here, and you, lead, you run into things like, I work in manufacturing. I live in Box Elder. If somebody moves into Box Elder and buys the house that I want for my kids, they could be telecommuting to Salt Lake, they could be telecommuting somewhere else, they might be making more than me and pricing out people in the local economy who don't necessarily have the same mobility, right? I want my kids to live in my area, how do I make sure that they can afford to live here? And that's something that we've run into the last couple of years with affordability getting worse in housing and inflation, right? So inflation over the last few years, like I mentioned, it's more money chasing fewer goods. We've had several sources that add to the inflation rate. It's not just one magic bullet of like, this is the thing that happened, I know why. It's a multifaceted issue, right? Inflation isn't always bad. It benefits, saver, it benefits investors, I guess is the big, big thing. It's why that at the end of a 30-year loan on your house, you end up paying less than what the house, house is worth at the end, right? That's the backbone of a lot of economic stability in the United States, why home, home ownership is so encouraged, only because of inflation. Because what you're paying initially is you know, a lot less than what you end up with in value 30 years later. Um, it's a big deal. All right, so inflation, just to give a little background on this, this is again, this is a long historical graph and there's a couple important things to pull out of this. Two things that are being tracked here, which is the federal funds rate and the CPI, which is a metri measure of inflation. The gray bars throughout this whole thing are different times that the uh, BLS has determined were recessionary periods. And one thing you can think about the federal funds rate is it's monetary policy that lets the Fed try and affect the, affect the uh, decisions of people already in the market. Right? That's the idea of changing the federal funds rate. So what they generally do is when the economy is in a recession, they're going to lower the federal funds rate, make the cost of borrowing money of doing business less, make money cheaper, and it incentivizes people to make investments. When we have inflation, when the economy is running too hot, when prices are rising too quickly, they'll do the opposite. They'll increase the cost of doing business, increase the federal funds rate, try and slow the economy down and keep track of that inflation. And the Fed has two mandates. They're supposed to keep unemployment low and they're supposed to keep inflation predictable, which in Utah is or in the US is defined as 2% inflation per year as their target. And the goal is to make sure that it's reliably 2%, right? You don't want huge volatility in inflation. You want it to be reliable and at this healthy low per amount. A couple things here that have happened in the last little bit is if you look back historically, our inflation rates from like 1990s were, you know, we have to go all the way back to 1980 to get into inflation rates that are comparable to our 2022 inflation rates, right? And it's, it's kind of strange. Here we see also historically though, we have the federal funds rate that's never been as low as it was during the 2010 period, right? So you can see this up and down motion during the grays. During the grays, you'll see the blue drop. The federal funds rate goes down, right? They're trying to incentivize people to do work and, or to, to invest. And that happened during the 2008 recession, right? Huge recession, unlike we've seen in the past, big deal. Government's trying to respond to this and, and incentivize people to do business pull us out of that as quickly as we can. And so they plummet the federal funds rate to basically zero for a while, right? Like I mentioned before the pandemic happened, economists were already talking about how the cost of labor and other signs were pointing towards a recession at some point in the future. The yield curve switched, things like that. And so they started raising the rates in the late 2010s to try and get ahead of this, right? Well, the recession happens in 2020. They plummet the rates back down to zero again. We see that red line for inflation start to come up and they start to increase the federal funds rate in response to try and bring inflation down. You can see a pretty clear relationship between when they start to bring the rate up and when inflation does start to come down, right? They were tied together. Um, and here we're sitting, they had a meeting last week. They're not changing, they decided not to change the rate. They signaled they don't think they're gonna change it in March, but we'll find out. Um, I want to point out in Utah, we have a little bit different history of inflation. We've seen a big spike in inflation across the United States during the 2022 time period, right? In Utah, we've actually seen inflation starting to rise a little bit sooner. So this is the CPI, that measure of inflation, but it's normalized back to $2,000. And you can see back in 2000, US and Utah are fairly neck and neck in terms of inflation, right? Now they start to diverge in 2015. This is pre-pandemic. This is before the inflation that we just had over the last couple of years. And this kind of points back to why is Utah, why would we have that? Well, it's the same thing as we've talked about a billion times, right? It's our demographics. It's a ton of people moving in here. It's the natural increase that we've had in Utah. It's the fact that we had jobs available and people moving in during that whole time period. And as demand locally increases, it's gonna become hotter than the national average, right? And that's what we've seen, that it prices in Utah and average expenditures are higher. The most recent data we have for average expenditures in 2022 just got released 
uh, this last month by the BLS, and it shows a comparison between people in the West, which isn't just us, but we are in the West, versus the United States. And it shows that across the board, things are more expensive here than the US average, which is a little different than we have long-term historically, right? We haven't been considered a very expensive place to live, and things are changing as we're becoming this economic group, that, or this, you know, we're experiencing all this growth, right? It's, it's increasing the prices of goods here compared to other areas. Um, you see it, it's lagging a bit in terms of like, for example, mortgage rates. They, ha they typically stay at about 3% of the federal funds rate. That hasn't quite hit that yet, but the fact that they've responded at all and made, you know, increased the federal funds rate does several things. Businesses slow down their spending, right? They're not gonna hire as many people as that slows down. We've seen people, for example, not move into Utah as often. Construction's gonna slow down. Housing buildings slow, because houses get more expensive, they slow down. And if you think the rate's gonna lower in a year or two, why would I build the house now when I could build it in a year and potentially make more money, right? So people are holding off, waiting for these rates to lower again uh, before they do business. Now the hard part is we talk about the Fed like they, yeah, okay, like we talk about the Fed like they can control all of this really finely and they really can't and they're aware of it. Monetary policy is only one of the levers that they can pull, right? And this is changing the federal funds rate, but a previous chair to the Federal Reserve, Ben Bernanke, did say, in short, if making monetary policy is like driving a car, then the car is one that has an unreliable speedometer, a foggy windshield, and a tendency to respond unpredictably and with a delay to the accelerator or the brake. So they know this isn't like a perfect solution to things, but with as gridlock as legislation is, we haven't been able to come in and have any fiscal policy to really answer this pretty directly, which is a bummer. Um, we already talked about this, how the feds have signaled they're gonna hold rates. Now, what does this mean for Utah? This is not great for our housing affordability. This is some data from the Kempsey Gardner Policy Institute that talks about the cumulative shortage of house housing for our households. So the light blue and light gray lines, the gray line is our increase in households. How many households do we have being formed every year? The light blue is the increase in housing units, which 2008, you know, housing slows down, housing increased throughout the 2010s and was speeding up all the way until we hit the lack of supply of goods during the Great Recession, the increasing cost of labor, the inflation that hit all at the same time. And over those few years, we saw construction of housing slow down while household formation didn't necessarily. So we are already struggling with housing affordability and it's only gotten worse. Utah isn't alone in a lack of housing permits. This is just percent change in number of residential units received, receiving building permits by state, the change from 2022 to 2023. Utah's at the very bottom of the list, right? We're down 37.2% in housing units getting applied for versus the year before, which is not great, because like I mentioned, we're still definitely increasing in population. What that's led to is uh, poor housing affordability. The back of the napkin calculation is that your house should be worth about three and a half times your annual salary. That was true in Utah throughout the 2000s and the early 2010s, and you can see affordability, last time we had it in 2022 is more than the average closing house price is more than six times the average median wage in Utah, which is pretty rough. It's rough for new people trying to buy a house. And as I mentioned, it's, you're not just competing with other people who are trying to buy houses, you're competing with a housing market with a lot of people that don't want to give up their home because they have a great rate they're not going to get back, right? So they don't want to sell right now. Uh, Utah is aware of this, right? Governor Cox is trying to do the Utah Homes First. We'll see how that legislation works out, but they're aware that this is a potential problem, that getting a starter home and getting your foot into the door into the real estate market is very difficult for new households. Um, and what does the future hold? I have a very short amount of time, so I really only want to point out two things in this last little bit, but there are signs that we're going to go into a recession. I think the, the previous recessions have kind of warped people's expectations for what recession means. A recession is not always a 2008 housing market complete destruction, and it's not always a global pandemic, right? It can be other things. It can also be a slowdown. The worst projections we have in Utah are that growth slows down and that our unemployment rate might go up to a 4.5%, maybe a five. That's not very bad. I mean, that's historically considered a pretty good unemployment rate. And things like this have to happen, right? As we run out of people to hire and companies are realizing it's too expensive to hire new people, they are gonna slow down. The price of, of doing business has increased and so people are kind of holding off waiting for a, a rate change. In Utah, we have a ton of job openings, so there's no real huge concern. People are gonna give up trying to hire those new engineers before they give up their own people, right? So that's kind of what we're waiting on right now is we're watching these job openings slow down as companies reevaluate and realize we probably won't be able to fill that position. What are we gonna do, do instead? Until the job opening rate slows down here, we shouldn't see too much of an increase in unemployment rate. The real, uh, real consideration here that a lot of economists use as a metric for are we gonna go into a recession is an inbuilt, inverted yield curve. 
which in short is are people betting in the long run or the short run? Are they buying three month bonds or 10 year bonds? 10 year bonds are generally offer a higher rate because your money's locked in for a long time, right? And as people start betting on the short run, it's this expectation of switching up. Maybe I should hold off and make this decision later. And when people start betting on the short run, that's that red line, which is really high on the far right, as you can see, is above the blue, which is the 10 year rate. People change those expectations. And when this switches and people are, are holding on to the 10 year investments and are buying three month things to just dip in and out of the economy, you tend to see a recession within a year and a half or two years, generally. Um, historically, you can see all these recessions were predicated by a, a flip in the yield curve, right? And you can think about it like the, the Fed issues three month bonds to deal with short term obligations, right? They offer 10 year bonds to build infrastructure and roads and schools and hospitals and all that kind of stuff. And all of those things cause jobs, cause movement in the market versus a three month bond is more like it hits the banking system and comes back out, right? And so it takes a little bit of time because those 10 year fruition timelines are a long time to deal with. But yeah, when those behaviors switch, generally it does lead to a recession within a couple of years. Does anyone have questions? Yeah. Um, as you stated, baby boomers have the wealth of knowledge to teach and contribute to the workforce. I have two questions. What advice do you have for baby boomers that are actively seeking employment, yet due to graduation dates and employment dates are not getting interviews? And then my second question is, does the Department of Workforce Services have consensus for this demographic? Uh, the ins yeah, the incentives one is easier. So DWS is a big umbrella. We do have, if you guys need help finding a job or you're finding, you're talking to somebody who is a baby boomer who is finding a hard time finding a job, DWS has a ton of those. We've got employment services to try and help with, the, you know, those mismatches. Because we're such a big umbrella, that is, I'm in the research and analysis division. I work with a lot of those people, but they're not mine. But yeah, DWS does a ton of that kind of stuff. As far as what would you, uh, what would you say to somebody who's finding a hard time getting back into the labor market? I think it's tricky because that's a macro level question and on you know a lot of that depends on for example what skill sets are they trying to get into it because some skill sets for example do decline over time periods some don't and just being willing to work has a higher value than it has in the past but it really does depend on their skill sets are they trying to get back in as like a CPA after not doing that for 20 years it's very different than I just need a job and I'm trying to work as a, you know a janitor for example because those kinds of jobs are available, but it's it, sometimes right now it is hard to match the specific worker with the skill set they'll be paid the highest for, right? So it should be easier now though than in the past because the uh, information flow between employee and employer gets easier and easier with with technology, right? Any other questions? All right, thank you very much. Appreciate it.